First Peter 5, 6 through 12. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Sylvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is, a true, this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Last words are important. You know, oftentimes at the end of a class, a teacher will be like, well, well, one more thing. I want to make sure you know this. Or maybe some of you who have kids that you've sent off to college, you're like, well, one more thing. I want to make sure that you get this thing. Well, what we are about to study are Peter's last words to the audience that he was writing to. Peter, as he started, he was addressing a letter to exiles, those who were being persecuted and dispersed throughout uh, the region. Uh, he, He exhorted them to be born again to a living hope. He called them to be holy as God is holy. Uh, he exhorted them uh, that they were a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that they might proclaim the excellencies of him who called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. He went on and he talked about how they should uh, submit to governing authorities, what it looked like to submit to employers, that the marriage relationship would look differently and display submission and care and sacrifice. He talked about suffering for the sake of the gospel gospel, and he certainly encouraged them at the end of chapter four to entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So there was so much that he wrote in this letter, but he's got some last words. He wants to make sure that we get these, and he shares three charges, three things that he wants to make sure that his readers understand. So he shares three charges. He shares to humble yourself, to be watchful, and to stand firm. So the first charge he makes is to humble yourself. So in verse six, it says, humble yourselves. But before that, in verse five, he says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He says, clothe yourselves, to put this on, tie this to your body, make this a part of who you are when you go places. This is, this is important. Don't leave it behind. But why would he want the saints to be humble? Well, because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He's aware if you're proud and you're not humble, God is going to oppose you. I don't know about you, but I think I don't want to do the things that God opposes. And that scripture certainly has many accounts of when There are those who were opposing God, starting with Eve. Eve wanted to be like God. And look how all that turned out. Sin entered into the world. Or think about Jonah. I mean, God wants Jonah to go to Nineveh, right? Go to Nineveh. I want you to tell them to repent and to turn back to me. And he says, no. What happens to him? He ends up in the belly of a fish. It doesn't go well when we oppose God and he opposes the proud, but why be humble? Because God gives grace to the humble. If you want to hold on to a promise, God gives 
grace to the humble. If you want to access God's grace, the quickest way you can go about doing that is to be humble. When we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what we're doing. We're humbling ourselves before God. We're acknowledging before God that we are a sinner and we need a savior and we're just coming before him humbly, confessing our sins. And when we believe on the Lord Jesus, he forgives us of our sins and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And if you're here this morning and if you have not been humble before God, I want to encourage you to be humble before God and hold on to the promise that he gives grace to the humble. And you will be saved and you will experience grace. But even once you become a Christian, as you humble yourselves before the Lord, you will experience grace. Paul experienced this in 2 Corinthians In 2 Corinthians 12, 7 and following, it says, So to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. And he goes on to talk about that not being a bad thing, but rather that being a good thing because then it changes his heart. And he says, for the sake of Christ, then I'm content with weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He experienced the realities of the blessing and the grace of God that comes when he was humble, and you will experience the grace of God when you are humble. So what what is humility? I think humility can be viewed wrongly. Oftentimes, humility can be thought of as, I just, I think less of myself. Well, the humble person is going to put themselves down. No, no, I'm not that great. No, 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 don't need anything from you or Maybe, you know, they're going to say unkind things or they're going to not ever want to put themselves forward or do anything. No, I've got to be. And, but the, the focus isn't to think less of yourself or put yourself down. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but rather thinking of yourself less. Thinking of yourself less. Someone who would put others before yourself. Even to follow the example of Jesus, who on the last night he was with his disciples, he took off his garment and he knelt down and he washed the disciples' feet. The great one, the perfect one, humbled himself and he washed the disciples' feet at the time that was one of the lowliest things that you can do. And he displayed humility and he showed them what it looked like to serve one another, to love one another. That's what it looks like to be humble. The definition of humility is the disposition of valuing or assessing oneself appropriately. So thinking of yourself rightly but especially in light of one's sinfulness or creatureliness or in light of your your humanity. So thinking of yourself, not just, just, okay, I I know how well I'm going to do on a test, so I know what what I'm skilled at, and so I know what I can do, I know what I can't do. No, humility is how you, you start by viewing yourself in light of God. That's the posture of humility. Humility. Look at verse verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. View yourself in light of who God is. Why is it that Isaiah, when he encountered the Lord, he said, woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. Why was he humble? Because he realized who he was in the presence of God. And it has an effect on on us. You will, the fruit of 
having this posture before God is you will think differently about others. You will think less of yourself. You will think more about them. When you have conversations with others, there's going to be more of an eagerness to ask questions. How are you doing? What's going on with you? Tell me your story rather than, oh, I can't wait to tell you about me. I can't wait to talk to you about this. And, you know, we've all met that person. You know, me, 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 me. The me monster, right? The person who's just constantly talking about themselves. No, once you acknowledge who God is and before him, you're just aware. And, and you just want to know about what God has done in the lives of other people. My mom is like this. It is super hard for me to understand or get to know what, what my mom likes or wants to do because she is constantly serving. She's constantly asking how others are doing. She's constantly not thinking about herself. She's displayed humility, not because she's just like, oh, I'm gonna be humble. No, she has acknowledged her God. Now, I know there's a time, certainly we need, we need refreshment. That doesn't mean you pour yourself out all the time, never refreshing your soul. No, we should have times where we refresh our soul with the Lord and we take care of ourselves, but the pattern should be thinking outward. So we think upward and then we think outward, others focused. It also has an effect on us when we want to even get positions. We want to have a place, sometimes even a place of authority. In this verse, it says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. Now, certainly, that does talk about on the day when we will see Jesus face to face, we'll be rewarded for that which we do here to bring glory to him. But it also can refer to even now. God's not going to put us in a position if we're not ready to be humble in that position. Once we get in that position, we want to be wary of the fact that we continue to need to humble ourselves so that the exaltation goes to him and not to us. So then we, we tend to, when we're humble, we look, at, we look at positions of leadership or authority as opportunities to serve rather than an opportunity for our significance because our significance is found in Jesus. So humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. And it goes on and says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. This is a benefit of humility. When we humbly come and understand who God is, we can cast our anxieties on him. You know what? You're, I don't really need to define your anxieties. As soon as I say the word anxiety, sometimes some of you, it's bubbling up. It's those things in your life, maybe the things you're worried about or the things that in your life get to the place where it just kind of feels like it's like ripping you apart. Or maybe it's a thing that it feels like it's just crushing you down, those anxieties. But we're told to cast those anxieties. I don't know if you've ever been fishing. I went fishing recently. I don't know if I would call it that I went fishing. I was present with others who were fishing. And this pastor, he is really good at fly fishing. And he's just kind of whipping this thing. And every time he casts it, it just like goes way out. And I'd be like, I can do that. And I'd be, and then it would just like plunk, like five foot right in front of me. You know, I caught lots of seaweed. And then he would just go, and he'd just send it. And it was just such a picture of casting it. It was just sent. And that's what we are called to do is send it. We're called to, to give it to him. Now, I know there's a phrase out there that, that people use that can be awfully confusing. Well, let go and let God. Well, that sounds wonderful. But my anxieties are not as simple as figuring out a fishing line that I can just cast out. When I try to apply this, like, let go and let God, I'm just kind of like, okay, 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 I'm going to let go, 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 ah, I can't do it. You ever feel like that? But when we renew our mind in, read this in context, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God. 
When we understand that God has the mighty hand, he's the one who can accomplish everything. And it says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So he has the ability and he has the compassion to care for you, to relieve that burden. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 11, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the one who spoke the world into existence. This is the one who went to the cross to bear our shame. This is the one who were to cast our anxieties on. So when we understand who God is and that he cares for us, well, we can lift those burdens because we're not hindered by, well, we've got to do something to have him take this away from us or we're not hindered from, well, God, God, he's just about wrath. He's not about love. No, we will go. And scripture even speaks of this. I mean, here's a few things. He gives us courage to face our cares and our fears honestly because he says this in Isaiah 41, 10, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. When we need wisdom and we need to get understanding for our situation, James 1, 5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. When you think you need strength to do something, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And fourthly, he gives us faith to trust him to do the rest. Because in Psalm 37, 5, it says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. And we could spend the entire afternoon just flipping through God's word and having promise after promise after promise that would point us to our mighty God who cares for us. And he says all. Look at your Bibles, casting all your anxieties on him. Not just a few. You don't just, there's not like a limit. Like, oh, once you hit three for today, you can't cast anything else. Or no, you've got to do this thing right here first before you can cast your anxieties on him. You've got to suffer a little bit. It doesn't say that. It says, cast all your anxieties on him. There's no daily limit. There's no hourly limit. There's no minute limit. So don't be proud and resist your good and kind heavenly father. Come to him knowing that he's mighty and he cares for you and you can cast all your anxieties on him. So charge number one is humble yourself. Charge number two is be watchful. Be watchful. Look at verse eight. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He says, be watchful. What is that referring to, being watchful? Back in New Testament times, oftentimes cities were not protected. There weren't security cameras and satellite images the only way that they protected, they would often build a wall around the city that they lived in. And they would have a watchman each night sit on top of that wall and they would watch. It was their job to stay awake all night long, sometimes in different watches of the nights, other guys would come in, tag them out, and they'd go because they wanted someone paying attention. They wanted someone looking out to see if anyone was going to try to come and storm the city. They were alert. That was their job. They were watchmen. And we are called to be watchful, to be alert, to be awake. Why? Because we have an adversary. 
The word Satan means adversary. The word devil means the accuser, the slanderer. We have an enemy who is real. He's real. He's dangerous. But we don't have to be afraid of him. Once a man was watching an electrician work on an electrical line. He said, it just amazes me how you fellows can calmly work on those lines with all of that power there. How do you do it? Now, I would have said, I shut the electricity off before I I do it. But in this situation, they weren't. They couldn't. The electrician smiled and said, well, the first thing you have to do is respect it. Then you can handle it. Satan is a formidable enemy. I'm not saying that we respect him in the terms of how we understand respect, but we do have to understand he's a formidable enemy. We shouldn't joke about him. We shouldn't ignore him. We shouldn't underestimate him. But we do not need to fear him. We don't. We simply need to be sober-minded. We need to be reminded he is a liar. Jesus said in John 8, 44 about him, he said, when he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar, the father of lies. And so it's subtle. I mean, even as we read this passage, he says, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Like the roaring lion, that sticks out. Like we know he's going to come. But how does a lion attack its prey? He doesn't just come out like screaming. No, he, he's subtle. He's quiet. He slowly tiptoes around, however lions do that, because he doesn't want attention drawn to him until the right moment. His desire is to have his prey deceived until he can overcome them. That's what a lion does. And that's what the enemy wants to do. And our call is to be watchful, not fearful, not, oh my, he's out there. No, we simply have to know the truth. And then when lies come, we can see right through them. The deception doesn't come. You, you've known, you've heard me talk about how, how do we know the difference between counterfeit money and real money? Uh, bankers don't study like gajillion different kinds of counterfeit money. They just know what real money is. So when the 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 false money comes in, they know what the genuine article looks like, and they can clearly see what it is. So the more intimately, friends, that we know God's word, the easier it will be for us to discern when lies come. Because when they come, we'll be like, wait a minute. There's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with this message that's coming my way. There's something wrong with this individual. What they just said there, that doesn't fit with what I know to be true. So that's how we resist him. Look back at your Bibles. So after being sober-minded, being watchful, knowing that your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, says, resist him, firm in your faith. Hold on to the truth about Christ. Hold on to who you are in Christ. Resist him. Now note, it doesn't say pursue him. It doesn't say we should go look for the enemy and just like, you know, pound him in the face. We're going to go find him. There was a time in my Christian life where I was like, okay, the enemy's out there. We're going to find him. We're going to get him before he gets us. We're going to go look for him under every single bush. There's got to be a demon under this bush and we try to look for him or, oh, maybe, maybe he's got these territorial spirits that are over a city. If we go and we, we find those and we cast them out, like everything's going to be going. Jesus never did anything like that. The apostles didn't do anything like that. They were filled with the spirit of God. And so when they encountered evil forces, the evil forces, most of the time, they were just freaked out and they were sent away. 
So we don't need to fear. We simply need to resist when they come because James 4 says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil how? By standing firm in this truth. Stand firm in your faith. David did this when he went against Goliath. He wasn't fired up that he was going to beat Goliath because he was some young whippersnapper that was like, I can do it. He wasn't arrogant in his own strength. I got these smooth stones. I can take them out five times over. No, he stood there because he was doing it for the Lord. He knew the Lord was going to fight the battle for him. He was doing it for God. It wasn't in his own strength. It was in God. So he stood firm in the truth of what he knew about God. And we stand firm in the truth of what we know about the victorious name of Jesus. That's what we stand firm in. So when those temptations come, or when evil seems to creep in, you stand firm in the truth of what you know. That's why we open God's word every single week. That's why when we gather in small groups, we open God's word is because we want to, have to live and breathe this book so that we can stand firm. We can resist the devil. And no, you're not alone in your struggle. Look at verse nine, it says, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. You aren't the only one who is experiencing hardship. Don't ever believe the lie that you're the only one. Maybe the particular circumstances about your situation might look different than the particular circumstances of your brother or sister in Christ, but you are not alone. You are not alone. All you have to do is look around you and you can see other Christians. They have struggles. They have pressures. They have anxieties. They have been bought with the blood of Jesus and so the enemy doesn't want them fruitful either, but you are not alone in this struggle. That's why we stand firm together. That's why we believe in our discipleship process that we should connect. Not only on Sunday mornings when we have fellowship together or we gather around the word or we gather to worship, but we gather in small groups to connect with one another because we want to stand firm together because we know the enemy is real. And we want to encourage one another and strengthen one another and build one another up. Now, one quick side note, one word of caution. If you're worried about evil or evil spirits, you don't need to have a discussion with them. Jesus didn't have a discussion with them. The apostles didn't have a discussion. You don't have to have a discussion with them. You can simply respond with the truth like Jesus did when he was tempted in the wilderness. You respond with the truth of God's word. Uh, this is not time to have dialogue here. This is what God says. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Because the power is in the gospel and in his word. It's not in you and in your ability. So, be watchful, be alert, be awake. Charge number one was humble yourself. Charge number two was be watchful. Charge number three is stand firm. Look at verse 12. By Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Stand firm in it. In it. That's why the series is called Stand Firm. That's why we referenced this passage when we started this letter because I knew this is where we were going. Stand firm in it. All of these wonderful gospel truths that we have learned, 
that when you go home and you can take time and you can spend time reading slowly through 1 Peter again, you're going to have all these truths that will come to you. If all you had was the book of 1 Peter, you'd have plenty of truth to stand firm in, to resist the enemy, plenty of truth that would help you to be humble. So let's stand firm in this gospel truth. Stand firm knowing that your present suffering will not last forever. Look at verse 10. And after you have suffered a little while, the the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish. So it just says a little while. I know it can feel the days or weeks or months Or sometimes you walk through a trial and it's years long and it feels like it has no end. But in light of eternity, in light of eternity, this is a little tiny blip on the screen of eternity. And these trials are just for a little while. We need to remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, for this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We need to look beyond now. We need to look to that day sometimes when we're in the midst of this trial, however long it feels in this life, because it will not last forever. There is one thing that will last forever, and that is when we will get to be worshiping with Jesus forever. So stand firm knowing our present sufferings will not last forever. Stand firm because we've received God's grace. After we've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, he's the one who called you. He has extended his grace. He called you, as we learned at the beginning of this book, before you called upon him. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he gives us grace to help whenever we're in need. So in Hebrews 4.16, we were praying about this this morning in the prayer meeting. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There is grace. There was grace for you when you came to Christ. There is continued grace for you as you humble yourself. He will pour out his grace upon you. And so we've received this grace. So stand firm in it. Stand firm knowing that we are going to glory. Go back to this passage, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus. This past Friday, we celebrated the life of Betty Howard. If you didn't know Betty, Betty had joy in the Lord. She went home to be with the Lord this past week and if you had the privilege of getting to interact with her the, the, the few weeks before she went home to be with the Lord, she was such at peace. And I would almost, I would call it supernatural because when I was with her, there was just an amazing peace. Why was there an amazing peace in Betty's life? Why did everyone who came, why could they tangibly feel it in the room? because she knew she was going to glory. She absolutely knew where she was going beyond a shadow of a doubt. And so she was standing firm in that truth, standing firm knowing that she was found in Christ and she was gonna be with Christ very soon. And lastly, as we stand firm, stand firm knowing our trials are being used to build character because he's called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Who's doing that work? You aren't pulling up your bootstraps. You aren't the one highlighted here. He's the one highlighted here. He's gonna do this work in you. He's going to restore, which kind of refers to mending nets, putting them back to the place of their usefulness. He's going to confirm. He's going to 
fix firmly. He's going to strengthen you and give you the strength that you need. He's going to establish you and lay that foundation. So going from the place of being broken and not useful to being fixed and restored and established to be used by him. Even though you might be in the midst of suffering, he is at work in you. Pastor Warren Wearsby said, When an unbeliever goes through suffering, he loses hope. But for a believer, suffering only increases hope. Why does it increase hope? Because we have this promise that he will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So Peter, as he he brings this to a close, after acknowledging these truths, he can't help but worship and says in verse 11, to him be the dominion forever and ever, amen. And he thanks Silvanus, a faithful brother, as he regards him, was written briefly and exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. He's like, stand firm in it, all this wonderful truth, stand firm in it. She who's at Babylon, who is likewise is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. In the first century, it's similar. Maybe if you've experienced European cultures, I have some family members that uh, grew up in Europe, and it's very common. Like when you you greet them, they kiss you on the cheek. First time it happens, kind of weird. You're like, I'm American. That's kind of weird. But it's, it's this expression of love. And I pray that that spirit of that expression would be a part of us. So he's saying, go back to, in light of all these things, this will change the way you interact with one another and peace to all of you who are in Christ. How can we be humble? Because we know who God is and we know that we have been brought to peace with God because of what Jesus has done? How is it that we can be watchful and not fearful? Because we have peace knowing that we are found in Christ. How do we stand firm? Because we know he is at work in us. So peace to all of you who are in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we now have peace with you. Father, we have peace with you because of what Jesus has done. You used your faithful servant, Peter, to write this letter to saints that we won't meet until we are in glory, and yet you've preserved it to encourage us when we are in the midst of trials and we are in the midst of suffering for your sake. Father, would we stand firm in these truths? Would these not quickly go away? Would they abide in us? Would this truth abide in us for days and weeks and years to come? We don't know what the future holds, but we know you hold the future and we know you will be with us until we see you face to face. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, now we're going we're gonna to transition to reflecting on this truth that we are standing firm in, the truth about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to take communion together. But before we take the elements together, let's just take a few moments as the music's being played to just reflect Maybe it's a time that you need to repent of something or ask for forgiveness for something, or maybe you need to come to Jesus for the first time. Let's take a few moments so that we can take this communion in a worthy manner as Scripture calls us to. So let's just take a few moments and just pray by yourself. Maybe you're also just going to reflect on these glorious truths that God has shared with us this morning and that you find peace with God, and then we're going to take the elements together in just a few moments.
The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Let's take the bread, remembering the sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf. And then he took a cup filled with wine, wine that would represent the blood that he would shed on the cross so that we could have relationship with God again and be restored. Let's drink the cup together. For as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let's be aware of what Christ has done, that your sins are forgiven. Let's stand for a minute. Now let's, let's stand and sing in response. <laughs>